Good evening and welcome to this very special closing night event with the makers of In a Different Key. My name is Katka Reschke and I want to thank you all for joining us at this finish line of the 10th annual Boston Real Abilities Film Festival. At the end of our discussion tonight, uh, we want to invite you to raise a glass of whatever you uh, find fit and to celebrate our 10th anniversary festival wrap up uh, with thank you messages and toasts. Uh, and now, before I introduce our guests, uh, I'd like to offer heartfelt thanks to our sponsoring partners tonight, um, who are Yachad New England, Gateways Access to Jewish Education, Jewish Family and Children Services, Jewish Big Brothers and Big Sisters, Jewish Vocational Service, and JCC Greater Boston. We are truly grateful for your continued partnership and support. And now, please allow me to introduce my wonderful co-moderator tonight, Rhoda Bernard, who is the founding managing director of the Berkeley Institute for Arts, Education, and Special Needs, a catalyst for the inclusion of people with disabilities in all aspects of visual and performing arts education. Rhoda, I'd like to hand it over to you to introduce our guests. My pleasure. Thank you, Katka. It is a great pleasure to be here to talk about a really exciting, rich, and, and really moving film. So I'm going to ask each of our four panelists to do brief introductions. You all have such illustrious bios. We could spend our whole hour on those, and we want to get to the questions and the discussion about the film. So forgive us that we've come up with a short little intro formula. We'd like you to tell us your name, where you are from, where you work, and your job title or you know, a little phrase about what your job is. And if we can start with Karen, um, and then we'll just pass it along. Sure. Hi, um, Karen Zucker. I want to thank you all for having us here today and having our, our panelists who were the stars, some of the stars of our film. Um, I am a journalist slash producer, and I'm the co-director of In a Different Key, the, the film that we're going to discuss today, and the co-author of uh, the book In a Different Key, The Story of Autism with my friend and colleague, John Donvan, who's here. And I was a producer at ABC News for about 30 years. I started when I was two. And... <laughs> That's about it. <laughs> Thank you, Karen. John. Uh, my name is John Donven. Uh, Karen's um, co-director of the film. We work together at ABC News. I'm uh, from uh, New York City, from the Bronx. I currently and for a long time have lived in Washington, DC. I also want to say thanks to uh, Boston Real Abilities um, for having us and for being in the company of some of the films that I've watched that are just astounding and um, it makes for an astounding festival and it's really an honor to be part of it. Thank you, John. Stephanie. Hi, so um, thank you for having me tonight. My name is Stephanie Keeney Parkson. Um, most importantly, I'm Dell's mom and Isabella. Dell is um, my son that has autism. He's 16 years old. And um, he's the reason why I am a graduate student at UCLA at the moment, pursuing my PhD studying black families that have children with autism. Thank you, Stephanie. And last but certainly not least, Amy. Thank you, thank you so much. And thanks for having me here tonight. I'm very happy and pleased to be here. My name is Amy Gravino. I am from Port Jefferson, New York, Long Island, born and raised, currently living in New Jersey. Uh, I'm a relationship coach in the Rutgers Center for Adult Autism Services at Rutgers. Uh, I'm an autistic adult and also a professional public speaker and an autism sexuality advocate. Wow, thank you very much. Katka, I'm gonna hand it back to you for our first question. Um, I'd like to begin by asking you a little bit about the film's journey um, from an idea to a best-selling book uh, to, and finally to this award-winning documentary. Who, are, who, do, who did you say you were asking? Well, I'm asking the directors. <laughs> so you go figure. You go for it, Karen. Um, we... 
basically the journey started about uh, 25 years ago, a few years after my son was diagnosed with autism. And I asked my colleague at the time, John Donovan, who was a on-air correspondent for ABC News, and I was a producer, if he would help me uh, sort of tell the story of autism that really hadn't been told before. And we started reporting on it um, that many years ago. And at some point we decided we should write a, a book that something that would be more everlasting. Um, and then we realized, I'm getting like some feedback, excuse me. Uh, and then we realized that um, we wanted to reach more people. We wanted to reach who we call the civilians, um, people who don't know as much about autism and let them help them to see um, to see the depth and the beauty of people with autism. You're looking for more Katka, huh? <laughs> so, all right, uh, I'll pick it up a little bit. Um, the film features a lot of different people, but the thing that really spurred us to uh, to finally get moving was um, the, uh, this, there's a man who appeared in our book and he also appears in the film named Donald Triplett and we uh, identify with him as the first person ever to officially receive a diagnosis of autism. Although certainly there have always been autistic people but the concept had not really been nailed down. So it was in 1943 and he was a child and he was the first person identified uh, in the first article that really fully described the condition. Um, and um, um, we, we got to know Donald who lives in a little town in Mississippi um, and wrote a lot about him. We wrote a magazine article about him and then the book and we were talking about doing in the film. And then one day in uh, late uh, 2016, we got a call from his family who told us that Donald was dying. He was in the hospital. And we kicked ourselves. First of all, we really had become close to Donald and we were sorrowful for that, but we were also sorrowful for the fact that we hadn't actually ever filmed a movie about him. And then lo and behold, Donald recovered and he got better and he was back on the street where he likes to be uh, walking around. And we said, we can't miss this chance again. And so we set out to make a film uh, framed around Donald's story. But then uh, while our book focused on history in the past, we decided to focus the Donald's story to use it as a lens to look at the present day and even the future uh, of people on the spectrum and how society responds to them and treats them and their families. And that's how we ended up looking at other issues. Um, that's how um, Stephanie and Amy ended up becoming, they weren't, they're, they're not in the book, but they're very prominent in the movie because we used the same title and the same thread of Donald Triplett's story, but we looked at a different, different lens, we took lens to a different uh, place in, in the film. It's, it's much more about today and tomorrow. Wow, thank you. Um, I have sort of building on, so we heard about um, the initial diagnosis and article and Donald and science. Um, so I'm gonna take the science thread and turn it in a different direction. Amy, you wrote an op-ed for CNN about an experience you recently have had that is connected to science, about how you learned about the genetic basis for your autism and what that meant to you and, and what your thoughts are about that. And I'd like you to share about that experience and, and what it meant to you. Sure, well, I participated in the SPARC study. For those not familiar, SPARC is a, is a longitudinal uh, autism research study that is looking at the genetics of autism. And I kind of got in on the ground floor because I became aware of it five years ago when it first started, because it's here in the New York area. So I know like everybody involved because we're all one tiny little family here. And I decided to participate and then I kind of forgot about it. I didn't hear anything. I didn't, I figured I wasn't going to get any kind of result. I did join the Spark uh, Community Ad Advisory Council and, uh, and I, I also joined a few of their other councils. And, and it was to my great surprise last December to receive an email that I really almost deleted because I thought it was incorrect uh, saying, we have found a genetic result for your autism. And, that's not the kind of news you expect to get in an email. You know, it's like saying we've found your long lost father or we've found, you know, it's like, it's a, it's a weird thing to, to get in the email like that. So then I, then I wound up having a phone call with Dr. Wendy Chung, who's the principal investigator of Spark. And that's when she explained to me kind of in greater detail about what this all meant. And I, I did 
I had sort of an identity crisis. Maybe I would say a three minute identity crisis because I, I burst into tears when, when, when she explained all this to me because I, I, I couldn't help thinking of what I had discussed in the film, which was all the years of bullying I went through and all the, the, the horrible things that I experienced when I was younger and how much of a waste it kind of really was because I wasn't being bad. I wasn't a failed version of normal. I was being me. I was exactly who I was supposed to be. And it wasn't my fault that other people couldn't accept that or handle that. And, and it took me so long to come to that realization on my own. I, I don't need a genetic result ultimately for that validation and, and for that. Um, but it, it, was a, it was a nice confirmation at the very least of, of you know, something that I'd already come to on my own. Um, and I'm still in the process of, of wrangling with what it all means. I, you know, to be told that you have this genetic mutation or whatnot, and and oh, you know, here's this whole community that you can go be like that. That's I don't. That's not my community. I didn't grow up, you know, identifying as having this genetic mutation. I, I this is not part of who I am necessarily. So it's going to be a continuing journey to you know figure out how that fits in into the picture of me. But um, ultimately, what I said in the article holds true, which is that the the mutation may have caused my autism, but it didn't cause Amy. That's that's something I built myself. So, and it took a long time to build, as I discussed in the film as well. Absolutely beautiful. Um, I love the thinking about how we build ourselves, right? The agency that's involved in that. Um, really, really beautiful experience. Thank you for sharing that with us. Thank you, Katka. I believe you are muted. I am, and I am no longer. Sorry about that. I want to go to Stephanie now and uh, and ask you. Um, to talk a little bit about the prejudice and racial stereotyping that is still persistent when it comes to diagnosing kids with autism. And given your work, you, you obviously have a personal uh, perspective on this as a mother of a young autistic um, uh, man, and you have a professional perspective on this um, as a PhD student. So can you tell us a little bit more about that? I mean, um, autism is really quite interesting. And, and one of the things that we don't kind of consider when we think about autism is, is who kind of built this diagnosis and, and what that means. And because it's built around things like language and um, social norms and, and pieces like that can be quite subjective. And we're, we're kind of ashamed or afraid to talk about that this kind of has a white framework and, and a lot of clinicians work from that maybe. Un, um, not even consciously, right? Knowing that they're like hearing a black kid use a rap lyric during um, during during a autism diagnosis, and then scoring that as abnormal, right? Because it's not normative to what white society understands language to be as normative, right? Rather than having like a broader understanding that you know, for black folks, conversational sampling, or for example, using a rap lyric in everyday conversation is culturally normative, right? So it's it's um, it's so much bigger and so much more complex than like big racism, right? Like where people would go out and just decide to be racist today. It's so much more nuanced and insidious than that where like really, really wonderful clinicians, people who I love dearly have those racialized outcomes when they would do anything in their power to make sure that they didn't, right? Like. I've never run into a clinician who, who wanted anything but the best for a family, but yet and still, we end up with these really terrifying health disparities for black people and it's across the board, but autism in particular being, being um, tied to language and social norms and things like that is, is really fraught with this. Um, yeah. We have a great question from, from an audience member that I'd like to uh, um, throw your way. Uh, wonderful film. You emphasize the importance of community and Don T's life. That is a large community that created his success. Could you speak about the importance of developing micro communities as an important step for support? You know, what's interesting is that um, Donald's community, you know, I said at one point when either during the film or at, at, after the film, that you know, we used to say we wish we could bottle what they what they had in Forest, um, but part of the success of Forest was the love and commitment that the people had. But it it was also his privilege and the benefits that he had, and that he was a white man and child in Mississippi and not a black one. And 
So, you know, in some ways, Forrest is the ideal community um, because he was he was loved for who he was. They didn't even know that he had autism. But at the same time, there were there were so many things that he had. He had so many more advantages than um, you know most people will ever have. Um, and the, the other thing though, the other flip side of that is that we find, and, and we've been finding sort of along the way is that the smaller communities, um, they do tend to embrace difference differently and more warmly. Um, Stephanie was telling us about um, the town her husband grew up in. And when they go down there, it's a very, she, she can tell you the story, but it's a, it's a small community. Everybody knows Dell. So every, you know, there's nothing Dell could do that would be wrong because he's Dell. And we need to bring that that kind of a feeling into larger society. It's not even micro communities in some ways. It's just that sort of understanding that it's okay to be like Dell or my son Mickey or Amy. You know, it's okay. They they are they are who they are, and they're wonderful human beings. Also, um, I I think part of the sense of the question is, you know, um, forest is a community in the sense we think of towns as communities, but um, there are micro communities, you know, um, where you work, um, in the classroom you're in, at the supermarket you go to every day, on a bus. I don't know, That's Karen, if you want to tell the story about the bus. Yeah, I mean, there's a story Karen and I told. Um, in the back of our book, it's not in the movie, but I think it's worth bringing in here in the sense of the question. Um, it's about uh, a young man named Nicholas in a town called um, uh, Caldwell, New Jersey. And back in about 10 or 15 years ago, he was, a, he was about 19, 18, 19 years old, and he had, had really challenging uh, uh, impairments for learning. Um, and, and one of the things he did not know how to do, and was hard for him to learn how to do, is how to use public transport. And so uh, a, a teacher spent hours and hours and hours teaching him how the bus works, and it went on for weeks. Um, uh, they started little tiny steps. That, you know, here's how to get to the bus stop. That's the bus. How to recognize it. How to call it. How to stop it. How to get on it. How to let other passengers off. How to pay. How to sit down. How to look for your stop. Step by step by step. It was like tiny little pieces, and it took weeks. And he made a, Nicholas had made a lot of progress. Nicholas, by the way, could not use spoken language. Um, but he had receptive language and he knew it was, he was learning what was going on. It was going so well that um, by, the t by the time this story takes place, the, the teacher had moved to the back of the bus and was just watching Nicholas sitting alone up in the front doing this by himself. And, and for all of these weeks, a micro community had developed because, you know, the people tend to tra travel at the same time of day. So a group of people would see this going on day after day, week after week. They saw Nicholas learning how to do this. But one day in the story, the bus came to a stop. Nicholas was on the front seat alone and two guys got on who were not part of the, the usual riders. And they sat down behind Nicholas and the bus starts to move. And, and as the bus starts to move, Nicholas begins to rock in his seat and he begins to, to flip his fingers. He's, he's stimming, it's called. And then he begins to vocalize, meaning he's, he's making sounds, but not spoken sound. So... These, these, you know, cl classic autistic behaviors really begin to upset the people, these two guys who are sitting behind him. And their response is to lean in and start to bully him, to like to mock him and to, and to sort of yell at him and say things like, hey man, like what's wrong with you anyway? What's, what's the deal with you anyway? And then this passenger, another passenger sort of jumped up and said, what's wrong with you? There's, there's nothing wrong with him. He's got autism. Now, why don't you back off? And, and at that moment, that bus became a community, a community that was protecting and watching out for Nicholas. And it was just by getting used to him, just by being with him, you know, in, in, the, in a, their daily, seeing him in his daily routine, they became uh, not just a community, but protectors. It's an amazing story. It's, it's, you know, it's one of those, it's one of those um, thoughts that I had that there's forest, Mississippi, right? It sort of it appears to be this radically inclusive community, but to create inclusive communities shouldn't be a radical idea. <laughs> exactly. Rhoda, over to you. So I can't help but 
um, want to ask Stephanie and Amy for their thoughts about this kind of community as well from their perspectives. Stephanie, can you start us off? Oh my, that's such a big question. Um, um, oh, it's the thing I worry about most having a child in LA, right? Um, that we are so far from our family and our family are our people, right? And, and that small, beautiful community that, that Dell does have with our family. Um, and LA is so big. Um, and to be frank, every time I drive past somebody who is homeless or struggling, I can see Dell in them and the possibilities of Dell being in that place, given that he's a, he's a person who can't participate in our capitalist economy in the same way. He's not going to be able to have a job in the same way that other people are, right? And he won't be able to do those things. Um, and so community is, is really central to that, like who takes care and loves this, this person throughout his life course when I'm not there to watch on the bus. And the bus is a very real situation in LA, right? Um, and you know, I think one of the things about John and Karen's documentary that I, I think is so lovely is, is the very basics of argument for community, right? Like cross-culturally, it's one of the few staples of human existence that, that really rings true for all of us. All of us who are raising babies want them to be loved and safe and cared for. We want community, we want acceptance for our children. We want them to grow up to be part of something and find their world meaningful. And that's, that's, like, that's the most important thing that you can probably take from this, you know, is that community is just central to this, central to this, absolutely. Amy, help. <laughs> I know you I, I know you got I mean, you nailed it. It's that community is everything. Yeah. It's the most central cross-cultural piece that I could ever think of. Yeah. Well, I mean, unfortunately, I, I can only speak to the absence of that community because I, I grew up in a small town, you know, about 7,000 people, but I, I'm, I'm here right now, actually. I'm here because I came for Mother's Day last week and my first COVID shot. And um, when I come back here, the people that I see are my parents. I don't have an old gang from high school. I don't have, you know, a group of people that I get together with. I see my parents and their friends. I'm hanging with the oldies. I'm cool with that, really. I've always gotten along better with adults than people my own age anyway. But we, you know, growing up, I, I, there was definitely a sense of isolation from the community here, I would say. Um, I was not embraced by the community because the thing about a small town is that everybody knows everybody's business and that can be a good thing or a bad thing. Um, and in the case of, you know, Donald, who was very lucky and had, you know, but again, he had that privilege of being from a, a family that was established in the community that had power and visibility. And that's not so for, for many people on the spectrum. And I remember I had to actually stop riding the bus at a certain point because I was being bullied on the bus. I had, there was a boy who followed me onto the bus one time calling me ugly Amy over and over again. And I think, um, it was to the point where my, my father had to drive me to school in, in the mornings because I couldn't be on the bus anymore. And so, you know, the, the bus is a source of a lot of traumatic memories uh, for me in that sense. Although I, I do, I live in Montclair, which is two towns over from Caldwell, and I take that bus into the city and I know that bus and it's a, it's a different kind of, you know, community thing altogether. But it, uh, I had to create a community. I had to find a community rather than be embraced by the one I was born into. And that often tends to be true for a lot of people on the spectrum. I think we have to find our own tribe and our own communities because the ones that are around us aren't always accepting. I, I wish that wasn't the case, but. So Amy, how did you do that? You talked before about how you've built yourself. I mean, mm -hmm. it's amazing how you describe that. How did you build your community? I, well, basically the, the I had kind of the lowest set of, um, standards imaginable, which is that I just wanted to find people who wouldn't run away from me or who I wouldn't drive away eventually. And that's kind of the fear that lives deep down in the base of my stomach um, and, and always will, which is that I'm eventually going to drive all my friends away because they'll see how terrible I am and how you know annoying I am. And so it kind of began there was just who will put up with me. But then that's kind of a really low bar, right? Because as people on the spectrum, we're often taught that we can't have standards. Anybody shows you the little bit, littlest bit of attention, you gotta be friends with them. And that's not right. It's, you know, there's a distinct difference between somebody showing you attention and someone actually caring about you. 
people can pay attention to you just to spit on you. Doesn't mean they like you. Doesn't mean they care about you as a person. But being on the spectrum, we're often not taught about those distinctions. And that's why I, I often hate it when I hear teachers and people saying, you know, calling an autistic child's classmates their friends. No, all these kids are not their friend. They're their classmates. They're their peers, but they're not their friends. And that distinction is extremely important because friends act a certain way. Friends behave a certain way. You do things with friends that you don't do with all your classmates. And we don't, it, we can't, we have to make sure to impart that distinction when we're talking about folks on the spectrum, because then it leads to, again, the place that I found myself in when I went off to college, just so desperate for friendship and for, you know, anything that, that it was hard for me to, to understand what toxic friendships were. And I wound up my best friend of 12 years from who I had become friends with in high school, wound up becoming a toxic friend. And I, and I didn't see it until she ghosted me. She quite literally just stopped talking to me one day and I was devastated. I didn't know what I'd done wrong. And then finally, I got enough distance to realize that it, it was a toxic friendship. She had low, low self-esteem like I did, but the difference was I started to like myself and things began to change for me and she couldn't use me anymore to feel better about herself. You know, as long as she was friends with me, there was somebody one rung lower on the ladder um, because she got bullied for her weight because she was kind of a bigger girl and I got bullied for everything else except for my weight. Um, and so, but once that was no longer a thing, I didn't have a purpose to her anymore. And so um, it just took, it took time to find real friends and real, you know, people who would, who would value me and who would, and who would, who, even though, even though they assure me they're not going anywhere, it was it, the only time I started to become certain of it was when I didn't have to check in with them all the time and say, are we still friends? Are we still friends? Cause that's what I used to have to do. Um, and my best friend now lives in Massachusetts, actually. She's from Framingham, hello. And, um, but it lives in Marlboro. And, you know, we go months and months and months without seeing each other, especially now with, with the plague going on. But we're, she's still my friend. And I don't have to see her every day to, to know that. So that was a very hard thing to come to a realization of that. And, and so now my community is, is people that I don't, you know, that's the funny thing is you grow up going to school and seeing the same people every day. And they don't, and they may not be your community at all. You may have, Nothing, they want nothing to do with you. It's not a place you feel welcome, but then you can grow up and with the internet and all the magical technology we have, find a community of people you don't see every day, but be closer to them than people you would see. So that's kind of how it happened, I guess. Thank you for that. Um, for that I want to bring up a question from, from, from the chat, uh, from our audience. Um, and it's really sort of a spinoff of what I wanted to ask you anyway, is how do you hope the film will be used to create change? Has awareness and action grown out of the uh, out of the book in a different key? The book, um, and I just want to add onto it. I mean, who who would you ideally want to see the film? This is really a question for the four of you, um, because it might be different for for you guys, John and Karen, and and it might be different for Amy and and Stephanie because uh, you know they're they're featured in the film in, 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 and it's not something that they expected necessarily to be like you did, Karen. <laughs> um, so how, so can you just uh, speak to who you'd like to see the film and how you would, how, how you see it possibly creating change? Stephanie, why don't you, what, I'd love to hear what you think. Um, okay. <laughs> Why, you ask such big questions, okay. <laughs> um, I mean, for me, it's absolutely essential that everybody sees it. Um, we're in a place in time, of course, that's um, post-George Floyd and America's had this kind of opening where they're at times more willing to encounter the conversation with race. And then what is important is that autism is experienced from a, a myriad of identities. You can be black and have autism and all these different ways of being and I need people to come to kind of terms with that and kind of and, and listen about how this intersectional kind of identity can be multiplicatively marginalizing for kids right like as in like Dell is not just marginalized by disability and ableism but also racism and they conflate at times right where we just naturally think that black people must be less capable Right, and, and having this particular conversation open up, um, man, the work that that could do on so many levels, right, is, is to think collectively about this. But I need 
I, I legitimately need everybody to see it because my, my goal, like, it, I'm sure Karen's is too, like, it, we have to make the world, like, way better for our kids, like, just way better for our kids. Um, and, and it's going to take all of us. I, I actually have always felt that the, that, that your portion of the film was the most important portion because it's a story that's just not told at all. Um, and, yeah. um, but the, the end that all of the different pieces do intersect. So we, you know, the selection, the section on policing, you know, it's, 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 it's not, it's not just a, a black issue. It's, it's a, it's an autism issue, but it is much more severe for, you know, people of color. And so we want this film to get into areas where, you know, it, to police departments, we want it, we, we want people to see the breadth of the spectrum, you know, it's, it's employment. So employers will be willing to hire people who aren't exactly like them. You know, it's the healthcare industry that, that, that really truly don't understand people with autism, especially adults. And they can, they, you know, sort of horrible things can happen to them. And, in hospitals, you know, all of the different sections of the film have a place in society. Um, and that was our, our goal was to reach the, the broad, broad spectrum of society with it. Um, who who you call the, the civilians, right? The people yeah. who are, who have no professional or personal. Uh, but, but, but don't know that they actually have a really huge role in whether people with autism will lead good lives. Mm -hmm. There's a question that's specifically for you, Amy, in the chat, and I'd like to read that out to you. Um, Amy, you've been a public figure and sex educator. Putting oneself in the public eye is hard for so many people and is particularly impressive given the experiences you are speaking about now. Uh, in the film, you talk about the friends who stood up for you and who gave you strength. Is there anything else you can point to um, to you can point to that helped give you the confidence to share your experience and your expertise. Um, well, I, 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 so I began. I've been speaking, you know, on conferences and at things since I was 14 years old. But I started doing it professionally around 2006, and just the year before that, I was interviewed for another movie um, called Normal People Scare Me, and it has interviews with over 60 people on the spectrum. It's directed by a young man on the spectrum, co-directed by him and his mother. And it was the first time anybody had wanted to put my voice out um, in any kind of, on any kind of a platform. I had never I thought that anyone would want to hear what I had to say, certainly not on that kind of a level where it was, you know, and they were taking it all over the world. They went to Qatar in the Middle East. They went to all different countries to show this film. And what I wound up hearing from them was that of all the 65 plus people interviewed in this movie, the one who was being asked about most, other than this young man himself who co-directed it, was me. I said, me, you know, I, I, I was so surprised. And that was kind of the, this first moment where I, I realized my voice could possibly have the power to, to help people. But, you know, in terms, in terms of sharing my experiences, I've never really been shy about talking about what I've gone through. Um, there's kind of this thing that happens when you talk about your sex life for a living, you just have no filter naturally. So I, I, I just kind of don't care. Um, and it's very liberating. Um, and I think it enables people to feel comfortable sharing things with me too and asking questions they might not have otherwise wanted to ask. You know, that's that's the whole kind of crux of it is that these are subjects that are that are hard for other people to talk about, not me. And so I wanna put them at ease. And I, I wanna show that yes, I am on the spectrum and there are certainly marked differences, but, but there's also a lot of similarities. You know, there's also things that, that we have in common. And, you know, that, like Stephanie said, I want everyone to see this film because of that. I, it's, it's like there, there are publishers out there that are just for autism specific books and literature. And I'm writing my first book right now and I want to pitch it to a, a general publisher, a, 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 a wider, because it, it, it's just, this is not niche. The story of autism is the story of humanity. And that's it plain and simple. And, it, and that's why everybody needs to see it because this isn't just about these folks in this film, it's about everyone. And, and, and how we're going to make a difference. And so, yes, so th that was something that made a difference for me and in, in making me want to start advocating and, and telling my story out there. And thank you for that question. Amy, that line you just said, the story of autism is the story of humanity. 
Um, if we had a tagline for the film, that could be a tagline for the film. Um, it's a very powerful statement. Thank you for that. Thank you. Um, so another question in the chat that I thought we could bring up, and this is for everybody. Um, it may focus more on John and Karen, but it's really for everybody. How did the subjects of the film who are not here respond to the film? Well, I'll let Karen answer this because there's a really nice story here that involves Donald Triplett. Well, our first film festival was in Oxford, Mississippi, which is um, where the state where Donald's from. And we invited him and his, uh, his family to come to the film festival. And not only did they come, but their friends and their family and their, you know, the, the, the man who we on the bank when Donald was working with, like peop other people who we met along the way while filming the film all came to Oxford. And when the film was finished, we introduced Donald and he came up on stage and um, thanked everybody for being there. And it was just, it was just this beautiful moment of, you know, having, this was the first person ever diagnosed with autism and the audience had just seen this film and then, and then there he was. Um, and we, we, we knew at that moment that, that Donald was happy with it. Um, but you go, John, add to that. So um, among other people who have seen the film, there, there are about 35, I guess, something like that. And um, actually not everybody has seen it yet. Uh, we've had no, no, uh, nobody has said, oh my God, how could you do this? This is, you know, um, th this is not me. I mean, two, two of the people we were most concerned about are here, you know, a Amy and Stephanie. Um, would, would, they, would they see themselves in the way that we presented them? And we were, <laughs> I, I, I feel really, I've always felt as a journalist when I write about somebody's life, when they see the story, are they, are they gonna say, yes, that's me? And I feel that you both did. So I feel pretty good about that. And we haven't had the opposite experience at all so far as we slowly share the, the movie with more and more people. So um, Donald is the most like focused case of in front of a group of, you know, auto, an auditorium full of people, we got to see his reaction to it. And he really, really liked it. So that was great. And S Stephanie sent us a lovely note after you saw it. Dell, your son calls it his movie. And you told me, I said, has he seen it more than once? And you said to me, well, it's kind of on a loop in our house. <laughs> so I thought that was funny. And, and Amy, yeah. Amy, Amy you know, um, Amy, you, you, you liked how you were portrayed, I think. And we're really grateful. By, by the way, we're grateful to both of you for trusting us um, as well, because it's a big risk uh, that you take. And, um, and you took it and we think we've lived up to it. So thanks. Do you all have any thoughts on um, the autism spectrum disorder nomenclature in general? I mean, we, we, we all know there are, there are lots of controversies with Asperger, autism, autistic spectrum. Do you feel that there, there are perhaps reasons to try to redefine or at least problematize the existing definitions and categories and, and diagnoses? That's all for all of you. Go for it. That's a very loaded question. Actually, um, and I think it's very complicated, and it's part of the problem that's going on. I think in the autism community right now, that there is such a broad spectrum, um, and those who can speak for themselves, um, you know, are are heard um, the loudest because they can. And and part of our film, part of the goal of our film was to create a film where the people who can't speak for themselves would have a chance to be heard as well. And that's what we tried to do in the film. We tried to present the entire spectrum so that you know, people who don't know about autism will know that, you know, yes, there are people who can speak for themselves and are, are, are proud of neurodiversity and, and having you know, complicated but you know, wonderful lives but that there are also people who, um, who are in diapers in their 20s and still banging their head against a wall. And, and that's autism too. And that story doesn't get told. And, um, and we're calling it all the same thing. Any other thoughts about that question? 
My, my guess is it's an unres it's it's a question that will be revisited. Um, it was only in 2013. It was only eight years ago that the you know, we, we give the kind of the power to, de to define these things to an organization called the American Psychiatric Association that publishes a book called the Diagnostic and Statistic Manual. It's known as the DSM. And about every six to 10 years, they revise it. And they revise it based on how concepts come and go and how research tells them new things. And um, autism wasn't in the book at all until 1980. And then, it, and then the diagnosis got very narrow for a time. Uh, and then it got very broad. And then it's split into different parts. So everybody I think has heard of Asperger's syndrome and Asperger's syndrome was, was a, a separate condition from autism in the book I'm talking about. In real life, that's all blurry. But in the book, there was, there was a Asperger's syndrome diagnosis and um, autism diagnosis. And then uh, in 2013, Asperger's syndrome was dropped from the book as a diagnosis and people who were given that diagnosis now became part of the people, uh, the group of people who have the diagnosis of autism. And so that's solved some problems and created some problems in terms of, even in terms of, of, of understanding what we mean by autism. And I think what Karen's alluding to is that there's tension between people at different parts of this definition who have different needs and understandings. And my guess is that because of that tension, in some way, this issue is gonna continue to be revisited by the experts at the American Psychiatric Association is my guess. I may be wrong, but it's my guess that it's not over. Uh, personally, I think that the um, that Asperger's was a very um, helpful diagnosis in, in in looking at the entire spectrum, and it was a way for people to identify um, some of the differences. Because really, in some ways, there's just you know, you, I I believe there are many many different autisms, um, but the the term Asperger's helped help people who, who don't know autism kind of clarify a little bit. And that when everybody's all called the same, same exact thing, that it becomes very hard to not just to identify um, um, the people themselves, but who needs services the most and who needs support and who's gonna, you know, for their entire life, um, you know, we're, the parents are going to die. We're going to die. And, and, and some of these individuals can live independently and some of them can't. And those are, those are different lifestyles also um, and different choices. And by the definition, by, by the name of, you know, what we call autism, that determines so many things for so many people. Can I say one more thing on that? I, or Amy, I don't know if you wanted to jump in. So I, I, I want to say one more thing, but I can back off if you wanted to jump in on that. Go, go ahead, John. Go ahead. I, I wanted to say that the film is really meant to be a sort of can't we get all along, can, can't we all get along kind of effort. Um, our big message, if our big message is that neurotypical people should stop seeing these the, the boundary with, with autistic people and, and, and we all become us, there's no they, there's us, that that can also happen along the spectrum, that um, let's, let's just support each other, let's recognize that we have differences and different needs, we have different degrees, and let's all get along. And so in, in the film, we, as Karen said, we wanted to portray the different parts of the spectrum, whose, even whose parts are hard to define, but we wanted to show a variety of presentations of autism and, and, and come away with the notion that we're all in it together and we all need to be in it together and, and and we all have to support each other. So it's a little bit why we hesitated when you asked the question to start to start this part of the conversation because our real theme is to is to is to say, yeah, those tensions are there, but we it's gonna behoove us all to get past them. Amy, I'm sure you deal with this <laughs> on a day-to-day -day basis. So I'm curious of your thoughts. I do, I do deal with this on a day-to-day -day basis, especially on social media where this argument continues to run rampant, much to my chagrin, because I think we have a lot of larger issues to deal with and I'm kind of tired of it. Um, I you know, switch back and forth between with autism and autistic, I, I use both. At the end of the day, I always say to ask somebody how they prefer to identify, that's kind of, it's like asking someone their pronouns. It's no different than that same kind of thing. 
Um, I think I, you know, I agree with the idea of wanting us all to get along, but the, the, the problem that comes up is that historically much of the getting along, the burden of getting along has been placed on people on the spectrum to fit mm -hmm. in, to adapt, to, to, you know, cram ourselves into the neurotypical world. And there has been less on, on the other side of, of neurotypicals coming into our world and, and meeting halfway. And so, so, you know, the, that's why I think a lot of people get stuck on, you know, the, the, the autistic, and this is a part of my identity. It's not, you know, I don't carry it along with me like a piece of luggage, you know, with autism. And so people get kind of stopped up on that. And I, I, I think it prevents us from having you know, larger conversations, unfortunately, of, of things that that we need to be tackling, um, and it's it is complicated. It's it's what, what, where I have the only thing I have a problem with is is anybody trying to tell someone else how to identify, and I see that sometimes. I see people going after people. You know, how dare you say with autism you're a Nazi? You know, you're a fascist. I'm like, whoa, like slow your roll. Okay, you know what I mean? I'm, I'm, it's, we, and, and I, but I understand where these reactions come from. I know there's a lot of pain that people are experiencing. There's so much that people have gone through that's led them to this place of where they finally have an outlet with social media, with online to be able to voice all of this. Where in the past, autistic people didn't have that community. We didn't have a way to get our voices out there um, before the internet. So that's, so now this exists and everybody can have a platform and say whatever they want to say. Uh, on the flip side, everybody can have a platform and say whatever they want to say. And so it, it, it it's a double edged sword. And it's, I've, you know, there's nuance to this that gets missing sometimes. It, it, it becomes black and white in the conversations that happen when it's not black and white. The world is gray and people forget that. So I try to bring that nuance back in where I can when I'm not getting savaged on Twitter. And for my mental health, I have to step back once in a while, but that's the way it is. Thank you, Amy. Um, another, another question that came up in the Q&A, um, one of the attendees writes, one of the most important messages in the film among many, and thanks again for raising up the intersection of autism and race, is about aging and autism. We are only beginning to think about this as a society. How can we use this film to encourage communities and agencies that serve older adults to think more about becoming inclusive, welcoming places for those aging with autism? I'll that out to anyone who'd like to answer. Um, I, I'll just start filling the gap on this one. Um, Donald Triplett is 87 years old. And he's been diagnosed longer than anybody on the planet. So at a minimum, the, and the film shows him as a little boy, the film shows him as a teenager, the film shows him um, graduating from high school and working in a bank and learning to travel the world and now slowing down a lot. When we saw him at the film festival and we mentioned it, he came up on the stage, Karen had to go down and help him come up the stairs. We've seen a lifespan there. And so on its own, the film puts it out there that people with autism, if they're blessed to live long enough, are gonna live long lives. Donald, Donald has that blessing. And by the way, the life, life expectancy for people on the spectrum is not the same as for everybody else. I just wanna make that clear right away for a variety of reasons that need to be dealt with. But there is gonna be such a thing as geriatric autism. And there's very, very little uh, work being done on it, on, on what the needs of people on the spectrum are as they, as they uh, get older. And so I think, I think the film just proposes the notion that, it, you know, it used to be 20 years ago, if you talked with autism in the media, anywhere else, it was always about children, it was children, it was children, it was children. They, those were children, those children have grown up, and a lot of those children are now speaking out, like Amy, who was a child, you know, back then. So we're not, we're no longer just thinking about autism as a childhood situation but we're not yet thinking about it as a geriatric situation. Um, and, and we need to. Uh, part of it is also Donald's family, as we point out in the film, had financial resources. But the, the thing that Karen has already alluded to it and Stephanie, that they're, gonna, they're not going to outlive their children. Ideally, their children are going to live long after them in long lives. But that means, you know, in the case of, of Karen's son, who's now in his late 20s, if he lives to his 80s, we're talking about where is, where is Mickey 50 years from now? We don't have that figured out at all, uh, what sort of community he would be in. So I think the film, we, we don't do a deep discussion of the issue of geriatric, but we just propose it by showing the lifespan of Donald 
and showing a man who was a little boy and now he's stooped over and walks very, very slowly. I wanna go to really the final question, I think of our Q and A so that we can move over to celebratory remarks. Um, and that is, you know, we've, we've heard from Amy and we've heard from, from Stephanie about Dell's reaction to the film. And we, we know about uh, Don's reaction to the film. And I think I speak for everyone who's seen the film. We're all in love with Mickey and we all wanna know <laughs> what Mickey thought of the film and how he's doing. Uh, Mickey is doing uh, great. He has, uh, you know, ups and downs like all of us and the pandemic was not um, ideal. And so still sort of recuperating from that. But actually, you know, because he's in part of a community, he had his first vaccine in uh, about 12 years, which he would never, he would never allow himself to get any kind of shot. But the community of first place where he was living gave him the support to do that, which was a huge, huge thing for our family, actually. Um, and I, the other question was... How, how do you like the film? Mickey has not seen the film. Um, we're, he's coming to Sedona. Um, we're we're going to be in another film festival. And um, he's going to see it with us there on a big screen. So you have some apprehension about him seeing the film? Yes. <laughs> Well, um, he's, he saw the trailer and he loved it. Um, and he was, you know, he, he says in the movie, you know, if you don't want to be in the movie, don't be in the movie. But um, I kind of want to be there and hold his hand that when, uh, when he's seeing it for the first time. Well, we uh, that's a hard thing. I, I had to hold Karen's hand the first time we, she saw herself in the movie. <laughs> that's because I didn't want to be in the movie. <laughs> right, right. No, Mickey was, happy. Mickey was happy to be in the movie. He just doesn't yeah. love seeing himself on the screen. Yeah. I, I, to John's credit, um, he insisted. And I think it, it, it helped tell the story. But I'm not, I'm not an on-camera person. It's not my, my comfortable place at all. Um, but there I am. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, and we're all happy that you, that you were. The film is fabulous. We encourage everyone to see it if you still didn't get a chance. Um, I know that you guys are only just starting on the festival circuit, really. So there's a long way to go, and I'm I'm sure it'll go it'll go fantastic. We wish you lots of luck with that and with Mickey's reception as well. I want to thank you all so much um, for you. being with us tonight and for your time. And please, now, I want to encourage everyone who's on this Zoom session with us to please join us for our wrap-up celebration. And you can do so by raising your hand at the bottom of your screen. You have a raise hand option. Raise your hand at the bottom, and we will be able to bring you up on camera. Uh, we want to thank you all, um, and we want I want to specifically thank our partners and sponsors, and I want to thank the Boston Jewish Film Board and the Real Abilities Advisory Board and my incredible co-moderators this year, Charles Baldwin, Judy Bolton-Fassman, Ariana Co Cohen-Halberstam, Paul Chiozzi, and Rhoda Bernard. Uh, and I want to give a big shout out to our tireless accessibility providers, Marie Bryant and Jennifer Myers, our card providers, and Brent Tracy, who's on with us tonight, and Michael Hirschberg and Rachel Judelson, our ASL interpreters. And I want to thank the entire amazing team who go out of their way to make the festival happen. And I want to thank the brilliant filmmakers whose work we were able to share with you this year. And now let me invite our executive director of Boston Jewish Film, Susan Adler, to deliver her closing remarks. Susan. Thank you. Thank you, Kat. The 10th anniversary Real Abilities Boston Festival has been all that we had hoped it would be. The films, programs, and wonderful audience engagement and attendance have been a joy to see. Our Boston Jewish Film team's effort to guide our audience and create easy registration steps, provide customer service, and include the accessibility components were evident, and I'm so proud and grateful for their commitment to excellence and hard work. Katka's festival direction and curation of films and programs has been masterful. Nisal Clark, Ariana Cohen-Halberstam, Joey Katz, Kimberly Shandell, Joyce Betancourt, Loran Black, Wesley Hicks and our outstanding team of interns are instrumental in the success of this festival. 
Boston Jewish Film is so proud to reach this 10th anniversary milestone. I can't believe how fast the, this festival has flown by. Uh, Real Abilities could not have reached this special anniversary without the very generous and unwavering support of the Ruderman Family Foundation, the JE and ZB Butler Foundation, the NLM Family Foundation, the Rita J and Stanley H. Kaplan Family Foundation, the Mass Cultural Council, and the Ruderman Synagogue Inclusion Project. We're also very grateful to our many film sponsors and community partners for their financial and promotional support. And we appreciate the guidance and leadership of the Boston Jewish Film Board of Directors and the Real Abilities Boston Advisory Board. And finally, a most heartfelt thank you to our audience for the enthusiasm and support you provide for this festival year after year. I really hope you enjoyed this closing night program and I encourage you to stick around and have a final toast at the close of the festival, which is right now. So thank you very, very much, everybody. Congratulations to the team. And um, I don't know, happy 10th anniversary. Thanks thank everyone, you. happy 10th thank anniversary. You. Raise your glasses if you have them. Unmute yourselves if you wanna scream and shout. Do it. Bravo. <laughs> Bravo. Thank you. Yes, Thank you. Yes. Congratulations. Salud. Salud. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Congratulations. Thank you, everybody. In a fabulous movie. Thanks, Thank Rona. You. Thank you. Great to listen. Thank you.